to another episode of SaaS Leaders Lounge. And today we're joined by the Chief Customer Officer of Client Success, Christy Falteruso. How are you doing, Christy? Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited for our conversation. Likewise. How has your week been so far in the start to 2024? Oh my gosh. Um, what day is it? Uh, you know, it's it's been a whirlwind. I feel like coming off of 2023, which was a brutal year for us. I know a brutal year for a lot of companies in SaaS. Um, I'm excited for this kind of like reinvigoration of a new year and a fresh start. And we've got a lot of good stuff planned. So it's been a whirlwind. Um, and I can't believe that today is the last day of February. Definitely. But this year we have 29 days in February, which is a little bit longer, which I we guess do. for some people is a surprise, but how is your, have you been able to do some traveling and, and get out and see the team and the customers? So actually last night I just had uh, dinner with one of my customers was in from the UK. I'm in New York. So they happen to be out here meeting with their teams and their customers. So I got to grab dinner last night. I will say the biggest challenge for us with like meeting our customers in person is that everyone is remote. So I don't have an office to go visit anymore where I can go see full teams and go immerse ourselves in the partnership. So I think that's our biggest challenge. So what we've tried to do is like just get on the road and target cities where we've got a good customer penetration and, and community presence and try to meet as many people as we can together. So it's like group customer success versus like these individual business reviewee focused one-on-ones with our customers that we, I think, were accustomed to before the pandemic. What I would love to do, Christy, is really just get you to give us an overview of yourself. I know you've had a lot of success and, and received many awards for your contribution to the customer success space. So with a, a few words, tell us about yourself. Well, I've never done anything in a few words, but I'll, pr I'll try to be brief. Um, so my name is Christy Falteruso. I'm currently the Chief Customer Officer at Client Success. We are a customer success management platform. So we help our customers, customers manage their customers from new to renew. Um, I've been in this space for about 12 years now, I spent the first decade of my career in marketing, in customer success. I've been uh, fortunate enough to like build, scale, and transform hyper growth B2B customer success teams in these awesome SaaS organizations. And uh, excited to continue that journey here at Client Success, where I get to really work with my peers effectively and helping them do the same thing. Great. And you've worked at a range of amazing companies, Bright Edge, Sysense, Better Cloud, and, and now even at the company Client Success. So what I really want to understand is how does it feel to be in an organization where the product that you're selling is really geared towards, you know, customer success and helping big businesses to move from new to renew with their customers? It is very meta right? Because I'm basically talking to my peers all the time. Um, so I think in some ways, it's it's really exciting, because I get to be very passionate and enthusiastic about sharing things that I've learned ways that we use our platform every day, because we use our own solution. Um, and so in that regard, I think the work that we get to do is great. And I'm very passionate about it. On the flip side, we are under a microscope, right? Everyone analyzes everything we do, everything we say, how we manage our workflows with our customers, because they're doing the same thing with their customers. So it's this kind of um, this interesting world that we live in because I love it and it's great and I'm excited about it. But then also it's like this fear because we have to be perfect because we're being scrutinized by folks that are doing the same thing. I agree. And at your time now in your role, how has it shifted from, you know, being a VP of customer success to the evolution of the CCO role? How has that changed your key focus in your day-to-day -day role? And how has it enabled you to have a bigger influence into how things are run in the organization? Well, I think that's just it, right? It's, it's the influence and the impact that I make at a greater scale. Um, you know, starting off in any, as any VP in any of the organizations I've been at and even here at Client Success, there has been this real focus on just my teams and running my day-to-day -day in the business. Now in my current role, I have broader scope, right? I'm working with sales. I'm working with product. I'm working with finance. I'm working on, uh, you know, our CEO, I work with him on investments and things like that. So there really isn't anything I'm not involved with at this point. And we're, we are a smaller organization. So because I think of our size, I wear even that many more hats. Now, the interesting thing is because I'm in 
expert, I guess, in customer success. I'm also probably our largest content creator. So whether it be our, our CS Leadership Bootcamp series or putting on workshops or webinars for our customers, uh, writing and producing content like guides and even the training content for onboarding, that's all stuff I produce because of my experience and my knowledge of the platform. So there is this real interesting scope of role that isn't scoped at all. It's almost like, Christy, whatever we need, we need you to do it. And so it's just about being willing and able to do it. But I love it. I love that no two day lo Tuesdays look the same. I love that I, I am so involved. And honestly, I'm somebody who loves to feel needed. And so this organization definitely makes me feel needed. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and would you also say having, you know, two, two days and not being the same and having to do a lot of the content stuff keeps you really hands on with making sure that the organization is keeping up to what the customers need and want to see. Absolutely. I think one of the unique things that I like to think that I do, and I hope other leaders spend as much time doing it, I spend a lot of time with our customers. I mean, a lot of time. And I try to do it proactively. I know there's a lot of leaders out there that if they look at their calendar, they are riddled with customer meetings. But guess what? They're usually escalations right? Something's yeah. wrong. And so you pull in the leader. Um, I like to think that the way that I've approached customer engagement from my level is that I'm very proactive about it. I don't wait for things to get escalated. By the point of escalation, I want to er already have like a deep rooted relationship with my customer. So we are talking to navigate towards a solution rather than us being introduced for the first time and it being very clear that I've got an agenda and they have one as well. So that's something that I've, I think I spent a lot of time on is just fostering real relationships with our customers. And again, fortunately, because we're, we're small enough and, you know, our, you know, we don't have thousands of customers, the hundreds that we do have, uh, I've been able to do that. And for your typical customers, what would be their North Star metrics and how are you pairing referenceable customers to some of the top prospects that maybe you're looking to bring on board? You know, the, the North Star metric for every organization is going to look a little different, right? Because some of the customer success organizations that we work with don't manage revenue. Others manage renewals, but not growth. Some manage all of it. Some focus on advocacy, right? Like it does depend on their business model. And there is no right or wrong way to do customer success. And there is definitely not a one size fits all model. Um, I say that there's not even a one size fits most. It's going to be very bespoke to what your business needs at the time that you are in your journey and the maturation and your product and your customers and all of those things. So, um, you know, I would say for the most part, though, customer success is working towards retention. They're working on growth. They're working on advocacy. And, you know, their contributions make a big impact on the overall business and, and its success. Um, you know, you can sell all the logos you want, but if they're churning before you've made a profit on them, that's not going to scale the business. So the work that we do is really important. It's very critical to the success of any organization. And I think, you know, we're getting a little bit more buy-in and support around that philosophy. And our job is to help our customers achieve those numbers. I agree. And something I always talk to leaders about, especially customer success and sales is like yourself and your team, you're very proactive in putting the customers first, right? And some of your customers will be larger and, and revenue driven and others not so much in terms of the customer success team. How are you able to make it so that it's both efficient and effective for both large and small customers to be able to put their need in the forefront of what the business is doing? Because I don't look at it based on size. So a lot of folks would segment their customers based on ARR or size of the organization. And those are internal ways of grouping your customers, right? But just because a company is big doesn't mean that both big companies will have the same focus or the same challenges or the same needs from your solution. So when you group your customers that way, it does make it very challenging to meet their needs through any model. So what we've done is actually tried to take a very different approach to how we think about our customers. And so I created a couple of years ago, something that I call the success probability score. And what we focus on is not how much they're spending or how big they are. Instead, what we look at is things like, is this a first time leader? Do they already have a customer success program designed? Do they report to the CEO? Have they built or deployed customer success software before? And so it's those types of metrics that are actually more behavioral right? That help us understand what will they actually need? Because a company could be really big, but if they are just building out their customer success team, 
today and they don't have a strategy and they're, you know, they've got two people on the team, their needs are going to be very different than the big company that's got a hundred person organization that's already scaled out, that's operating like, you know, a well-oiled machine. So it doesn't matter how big they are. It's all about the team dynamics and the makeup under that leadership. So we focus on that and that allows us to prioritize what our customers need more so than what we think we need. Interesting. And and typically, would you say when you're talking with first time leaders or maybe an organization that's building out their customer success team rather than already having one established, do you find that they would immediately see value in the client success custom onboarding portal, for example? Yeah, I mean, we have to spend a lot more time educating and enabling uh, customers in those situations, right? Because they don't know what they don't know. And they're in this as much to learn personally as they are to drive their organizations forward. So, you know, listen, I always do, I always like to preface it by saying, listen, you shouldn't be buying software to solve a problem that you don't have yet. And so I think it is a bit of a challenge because a lot of leaders, they assume that, you know, I want to get it right day one. And so I want to put software and tooling in place. But the reality is you're not mature enough to actually have a real business need. Uh, not that I don't want sales, right? I want our sales team to sell, but it does make a challenge for us. And so in terms of value that our customers can get from the platform, yes, I always say everyone can be successful with a solution like ours, but how are you defining success? That's where it really changes. You're not going to get the same value out of a platform when you've got a full built out strategy and you know what you need to do and you're going to, you're ready and prepared to use it to its fullest extent. If you're a small organization just getting started, guess what? You know what? Let's just start with having a health score. Let's understand which of our customers are healthy or not. We're not trying to boil the ocean. So the value outcomes are different depending on the maturation of the business. And with the client success portal or platform, how important is it to foster collaboration and and increase efficiency how are you able to do it with the platform and how important is that enablement piece when they're implementing the solution i mean enablement is everything because anybody who buys technology you're orchestrating through change management right that's it at the end of the day it's not like can you figure out how to click the buttons in my software Yes. Yeah. My, my solution is very straightforward. We've got an easy to use UI. Like you can come in here and figure things out, but if you don't have a strategy behind it and can't orchestrate all of the pieces and components in the platform together to like drive meaningful outcomes, you're not going to get value from it. If you're looking at it very siloed module by module, there's no real value there. It's just, you're using something for the sake of using it. So what we've got to do is actually spend more time educating and enabling on How do you think of a cohesive strategy? What's the real value outcomes? And then what are the workflows to support that? And then we have to invest time in training, enabling the teams to build the muscle memory on how to use it in their day to day. Um, This is not easy. This is, it takes a lot of work. And to be honest with you, what we've tried to do is actually rely on just creating as much content as possible to help with that, because not everything can be one-to-one. Definitely. And I have seen, you know, those organizations that are putting a lot of content out there and making sure that there's webinars to enable their buyers to really understand what they're getting and the value that they can receive from it and how to use and and go through that change management process with the solution. They get a lot more return on investment quickly. um, And they're also, you know, getting a higher customer experience and satisfaction score back from the vendor side. So that leads me to another question of why did you decide to join client success and how are you driving customer experience within the organization and for the customers? My gosh, those are two very loaded questions. Um, <laughs> how did I find myself here at client success? I'm going to give you the short version. Um, basically I worked at a bunch of other companies before I got here. Right. And the first company I worked at where I started my career in customer success, I was a subject matter expert, right? I left my career in marketing. I went to go work for a company that I had used their product before. So I was a customer of theirs and I was a subject matter expert. It was a no brainer for me. I was able to provide real value for my customers because I was a customer and I knew how to use the solution to drive my business forward. So to be very consultative in that role, it was easy. It was so natural and I really enjoyed the work that I did. Fast forward, I went to a bunch of companies 
that were operating in spaces that I didn't have a passion for. I didn't have a real understanding of our customer's pain because I'd never done their work before. And quite frankly, I wasn't really interested in the product. And when you're not bought in that way, it makes it a little tricky, right? I mean, I worked for some interesting companies doing very cool stuff, but I was not passionate about BI. I was not passionate about SaaS apps management. I was not passionate about telematics. So when I thought about where I needed to land to really build and foster a career that I could be excited about and proud of, um, I thought, you know what, I need to connect the dots to the work that I love to do. And the work that I love to do is customer success. So for me, it was a no brainer that I wanted to find myself working for a technology company that provided value to customer success professionals. It did not need to be a CSP, although it turned out to be. Uh, it could have been any technology that serves our people well. Um, and so that's what led me to client success was this real passion that I have for the community and for my peers and helping them be as successful as I've been using customer success software. So that's how I got here. Now, in terms of how I think about the value contributions to the organization, I think it stems off of that, right? I'm, I'm an expert in this field. I love the work that I do. I understand the pains of my customers. I can design programs, processes. I can orchestrate this team to make sure that my customers are getting exactly what I know that they need all the time. By making that my core focus, I drive retention. I drive advocacy. I drive raving fans in our book. We drive growth. Now, listen, are our metrics perfect? No, but is there room for us to improve? Yes, obviously. So we, we're a work in progress, right? Like we have a lot of opportunity and a lot of upside, but that's part of this journey that we're on. And I think every organization aspires to be a little bit better every day. I'm working on trying to figure out what my contributions can be, even outside of the scope of my role, to continue to push our business forward. For us, sometimes that's content creation, right? And that's probably the thing I spend the most time on outside of my day-to-day -day CCO role. And your passion's, you know, clear for customer success and, and making sure that the wider community understand how they can improve day to day. And you are part of some of the largest customer success programs and cohorts. So I want to ask you, what are some of the lessons and skills that you've really been able to develop along your journey um, to becoming the person that you are today and helping others to, you know, be the best version of themselves in customer success? Um... I don't know that this is going to be something that anyone's going to care about, but I'm going to say it because I think it's going to be the thing that helped me the most. I had to get past my fear of failing, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of customer success professionals are probably like a type A personality. They want to be overly helpful. They're used to being high performers, top performers. Um, and so it, it terrified me to ever think about not performing optimally, right? Like being the best I could all the time. And so that prevented me from taking calculated risks, right? Because I never wanted to fail. When I got out of my own way and said, you know what? It's okay to fail. We have to fail to learn, to grow, to move the business forward. And so when I was able to just celebrate my failures and actually be like, this is so cool. I did this thing. It failed miserably, but here's what I learned. When I learned to embrace that mindset, I think it kind of parted the clouds for me, right? And it, it built this maniacal focus on like, keep trying to figure it out. Just keep testing, keep doing, you'll figure it out and you'll nail it. And I think just operating with that mindset of like, don't be afraid to fail, try new things and make sure that you're learning in every situation. Making that my mantra has, I think, really significantly contributed to my overall success. And what what would you say has been some of the biggest failures that you've had in your career? Okay, so my biggest failure is not an isolated failure. This would be like telling a kid not to touch the stove. They touch the stove and then they burn themselves, but then they touch the stove again and they burn themselves again. Yeah, so I was more like that kid. Um, so I would say the biggest thing that I did where I fell miserably, I wouldn't say I failed miserably, but I learned a lot. I used to think that because customer success a certain way worked in the first organization I was at, that it's a cookie cutter. I just take exactly what I did there and apply it at my next company and then try to do it again. And guess what? Didn't that work. doesn't work. Didn't work, <laughs> right? Because we had a different product. We had different needs, different customers, different, different market. Uh, it just, it, it, that was, you know, what I learned quickly uh, as a leader once I had left my initial organization is I just thought, wow, okay, this this operating model 
it just, it got us so far. We went from when I joined the company, we were 15 million. By the time I left, we were 85 million. I had a global team. I went from an individual contributor to a, a VP of customer success. And I just thought, wow, okay, like I'm just going to go and replicate that because it worked and it didn't work and it didn't work. And it, it big time didn't work. And so learning to just kind of like pick myself up and be like, okay, this didn't work. Why didn't this work? Learn and pivot. That was probably, I think, some of my biggest lessons learned out there. And now I will tell you, I don't even like to steal practices of things I did previously. Even if I know this one little thing will work, I like second guess, third guess myself because I'm like, nope, 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 not going to do it. Just because it worked there doesn't mean it'll work here. So I, I actually learned really well and the hard way to think about problems differently and solutioning differently. So instead of trying to just pull from this arsenal of doing the thing that worked, I spend more time thinking about why did that work? And then how can I apply some of the lessons learned and why that worked and apply that here, given what I have. Interesting. In, in your role now at Client Success, I guess, since shifting from the VP of Customer Success to Chief Customer Officer, what would you say was one of the biggest learning curves for, for you moving? I know the role is pretty similar, but what was the biggest learning curve for you when you made that shift? Because it is a pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's a new role, right? It's only been something that's in the last five or 10 years really come about. My metrics don't matter. The organization metrics matter, right? I used to be so focused on like, retention and growth and advocacy, like my micro metrics, which were part of the bigger organization's performance. Yes, they contribute to that. But now I also have a big vested interest in how is sales doing? How is product doing? How is finance doing? How is marketing doing? So I no longer live in this kind of like myopic view of my team. And now I have to care about the bigger business. And so I find myself justifying some of the things that sales does or celebrating some of the things that marketing does or the way that finance does things, right? Like, and just, I have a different appreciation for what it takes to drive an entire business forward, not just my team. And in the CCO role that you're in now, it obviously gives you a seat at that executive table. What are some of the key initiatives and programs that you're able to drive and get approved at that higher level now? Right, right. So again, the unique thing here is that we are a small organization. So honestly, I have to be very honest. I'm not going to give you like a like, oh, I'm just really good at, at convincing people. No, I get to do whatever I want for the most part. Right. So I have a CEO who trusts me, who believes in me and who understands how I think about customer success and understands that I want to be a bit more progressive and a little provocative with the types of things that we do. He empowers me to do that. I have full autonomy to try things. And so, you know, I think the the big thing here is that I, I get to run in the direction I want to because I have the trust to do so. So I think I just operate a little differently in that regard. I don't know that most people would have the same autonomy that I have, um, but that's, I think, something that makes it unique because I am an expert in this field. I, I understand customer success software differently than somebody who doesn't have my background. And, you know, I get to do really cool and creative things. And I think that that em empowers me to also try things that others aren't. And probably that's also what's contributed to the success I've had in the broader community, because I get to take chances and risks that others don't. And it's good that you're able and willing to take the risks. And for somebody that has that creative mindset and, you know, does so much outside of your day job, I guess it gives you a chance to experiment with new things, to see what works. And as you said, not being scared to fail is a big thing, right? If you're not, not willing to take the chances and the risks and try new things, how will you be able to elevate the, the organization and your team and the customers? Um, and just as I move away from this, I want to talk more about yourself now and some of the stuff that you're doing in the background. You've got your own podcast. Um, talk me through that. I know you've had some great guests. I've watched a few of your episodes, but... I really want to, you know, drive this because it's something I'm passionate about. And I just want you to talk to us about that and what it's doing for the community. Absolutely. So, I mean, I think, listen, I'm, I'm not as young as I once was. Uh, I'm in my mid forties, but you know, I'll never forget my experiences growing up professionally in my career. And so one of the things that was a real struggle for me is I didn't 
have any women's women mentors. I didn't have, there were no women executives present in my journey that I could emulate and learn from. And so that was a real big gap for me. Um, you know, as a young professional woman, I wanted to be able to look at somebody else and be like, okay, I get it. And they're blazing this trail for me. And I know how to act and how, how to talk and how to, how to grow my career and how to, you know, create boundaries and how to stand up for myself. And I didn't have that. So, you know, I struggled trying to figure it out on my own for years and years and years. And those struggles led to, you know, failures and, and me tripping up in my journey in ways that I, that weren't necessary, right? If I would have had people to emulate and learn from and, and to guide me, I think my career could have looked a little different. Maybe not, but I like to think that it could have. So that brought me to creating my podcast. She's so sweet, spelled S-U-I-T-E. So the idea here is that I'm interviewing C-level women in tech about their career trajectories, their learnings, their successes, their failures, their challenges, and giving them a platform more broadly to speak to aspiring leaders. And it doesn't have to be females. It could be males. There's lots of learnings in these episodes. But I think shining a light on women specifically in tech who are sitting in C-level positions is really important. I think it's important for us all to just understand the trials and tribulations that they all navigated and how they got to where they are and and what drives their success moving forward. Um, Personally, I've learned a ton. I've only released four episodes so far, but I've already booked 23 guests. And this is a bi-weekly podcast. So guess what? By the end of May, I will have recorded a full year's worth of content. Um, so it's just really inspiring the the caliber of women who have volunteered to be a part of this journey with me is amazing. Um, you mentioned you just listened to one of the episodes we just recorded with the CRO at Calendly, Jessica Gilmartin. She's newly appointed to the CRO position. She was the CMO at Calendly. And now they've appointed her to CRO. So she's over sales and marketing. I mean, these are women who are doing Herculean things uh, with amazing backgrounds and all so different and have such different journeys that I think that there's so much for us to learn from them. Definitely. And as you said, from going from chief marketing officer now to being the chief marketing and revenue officers is a lot of responsibility. And she right. did touch on some some amazing topics. I know some of it was about being authentic and being yourself. And I know as as somebody young and early in their career, this is something that's often hard, right? For people to be authentic and feel like themselves. They almost want to fall in line with what they feel the organization and their leadership wants to see. Yep. But sometimes being the best version of yourself is just being true to yourself. And that's something that Jessica was talking about in the podcast. Yeah. I mean, Jessica did a great job of, of kind of articulating what her experiences with that were. She talked a lot about her imposter syndrome that she struggled with a lot. She had spent the first four years of her career in investment banking, which if you've worked in finance, you know, is a very, very tough industry and not for the the thin skinned, let's just put it that way. So it's, it's really hard. And so she shared her journey of navigating all of that. And, you know, for me, listening to another woman especially a leader who is somebody who I, I mean, I would look up to her I mean, she's very impressive career, what she's built. I struggled with that a lot myself. I mean, I broke into tech after spending a decade in marketing and I always talk about this, but my first career at a SaaS company, I didn't even know what SaaS stood for. Okay. I didn't know what these metrics are. I didn't know about this universe. This was so foreign to me. And so I just kind of thrusted myself into this new world, not knowing anything. Everyone I worked with had an Ivy League degree. Everyone went to like Duke or Harvard or Stanford or Wharton. And I went to some like rinky dink local university on Long Island and had my bachelor's degree in public relations. And talk about imposter syndrome. I was like, which one of these is not like the other, right? I just didn't belong. And so I always used to doubt myself and be and question like, how am I here? Do I belong here? Is this right? Should I be doing something different? I always felt less than. And it took me a long time in my career to one, recognize that that's not a valid feeling, right? There is nothing validating what I was thinking in my head because at the end of the day, I was a top performer. I did really great work. My customers loved me. The organizations I I worked for really embraced me. And there was no reason for me to feel the way I was feeling. Now, as a leader, had I had heard somebody like Jessica earlier in my career and really recognized what it was that I was experiencing, I didn't even know what it was called then. I didn't know it was imposter syndrome. I just thought like, I'm dumb and all these people are smart and I don't really belong here. And 
wow, they really, they hired me. Like I did, like, I just never felt like I fit in. So having, having known that earlier, I think it would have changed it for me. I think I would have probably been a little bit further along in my career. Cause I think that that feeling of doubt and not belonging probably held me back for a little bit. Well, I think more people suffer with imposter syndrome than, than, than it's talked about. And I guess in the last five or 10 years, it is something that is becoming more spoken about in the industry. And as you said, having sponsors and mentors early in your career is definitely something that is a game changer and helpful with that development along the way. And I guess from a leadership standpoint, you know, many people need to focus on business impact, which is something else that Jessica mentioned yep. as well. Would you agree that, you know, many people lose sight of this when they're in leadership positions? I think every leader is different, right? Everybody has different drivers and different ambition. Um, I think early in my career, I don't think, early in my career, let me be very definitive about this, early in my career, I chased title and I chased money. And that's not uncommon, right? Like I'd get a manager role. How do I get to director, right? I used to put these arbitrary values tied to my age, right? Like by the time I'm 30, I want this title. By the time I'm 30, I want to be making this much money. Okay. Now that I'm 30, I make this much money. I have this title. What's next? 35. I want this title. I want this compensation, right? I want to sit on these boards. I want to do this work. And you create these things for you that aren't based on anything real and substantive. And so what I started to do was stop focusing on those things and start to focus on what are the things that I love? What do I really enjoy doing? What brings me joy? What are my passions? And I started chasing those things. And honestly, the minute I shifted focus, my career took off, right? Now, I, my, my LinkedIn inbox, I can't even keep up with it. I'm being asked to be on all kinds of things. I speak with people who never, I never in a million years thought would entertain a conversation with me. I get approached by recruiters for jobs that I'm like, you're crazy. I can't do that job. And it's, it's wild. But the minute I stopped focusing on the things that were so, I think, I don't want to say selfish, but like, right, those things are selfish and started focusing on how can I give back? How do I benefit the organizations I'm a part of? How do I benefit the community that I, I so gratefully get to be a part of? When I made those things the focus, everything changed. And that mindset shift then. How did it start to make you think about the other things in the background that aren't professionally related? You look at your family, your your husband, Paul and the family. How did that shift, you know, your mindset, not just to focus on the money and growing your career, but the things that really mattered for you? It made me happier and it made me a better mom and it made me a better wife. And, you know, I'm more pleasant to be around, <laughs> quite frankly, because I'm happier every day. Now, listen, I always say, like, I might have the most senior title I've ever had in my career, but I am not earning as much as I once did. Yeah. The money wasn't important. But if I can wake up every day and feel fulfilled and energized, and I love the work that I do, and I, I truly feel like it is an honor and a privilege to sit in the seat that I get to that, that I get to sit in every day and to do the work and to serve the community. I feel honored. Like it is it's such like a humbling experience for me now. And for my family, like they have the better version of me. They have a happier version of Christy. Every day I show up differently as a mom, as a wife, uh, as a daughter. And I think that's, that's the real blessing is how that kind of trickled out. When I was focused on things like, you know, my, my title and my money, like I, I was stressed all the time, right? I was like focusing on the wrong things that didn't serve me well internally and I think caused me undue stress and aggravation, right? Because someone would get promoted and I'd be in, up in arms because like, why wasn't that me? And like, now I'm stressed and I'm sad. Like, I just don't even care about that. I want everyone to be successful. I want everyone to be happy. I just want to wake up every day and do the things that I love. And by living my life that way, I am so much more better off. Now, I am working more now than I've ever worked in my career because I do so many things outside of my day job. But it brings me joy. It's so fulfilling. And I'm just, I'm happier. And if you had advice for, you know, first time leaders or leaders moving into a C-level position, whether it's customer success, sales, revenue ops, what would be some key pieces of advice that you like to share with them to make sure that they get the best possible start in their new role? You get what you work for. Right. There is no, I expect this. I want this. I worked a year. I deserve that. Stop. 
you're going to get out what you put in. You work harder, you do the extra, you step outside your role, you stay committed and focused. You're going to go so much more. You're going to go so much further. Um, You know, one of the things that I think helped contribute to my success, I may not have always been the smartest person in the world, in the room. I would outwork and out hustle and out grit any single person on my team. I am not afraid of hard work. And I think for folks that want to be in senior leadership roles, you have to recognize there is not this utopian state of work-life balance. There just isn't. I'm sorry. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. If you want work-life balance, find a nine to five job. Executive leadership in tech at a startup does not exist. Do not lie to yourself. I won't lie to you. I work around the clock. Do I create boundaries? Do I make sure that my family is prioritized appropriately? Yes. But there's no time where I'm completely disconnected. I And I'm okay to, to operate like that, right? Like I'm okay to have my email on my phone and my Slack on my phone. When I'm having dinner, my phone gets shut off. When I'm with my daughter, my phone gets shut off. Me and my husband, we have our alone time at night, no devices. You create appropriate boundaries, but at the end of the day, work has still got to be a top priority if you want to make that a big part of your, you know, professional career. And and would you say that your your upbringing was a key part in that grit and that hard work that you've come to continuously demonstrate? A hundred percent. Um, you know, I I my parents, uh, my dad is from Puerto Rico. He came here when he was sixteen. He does not have a high school diploma. He definitely didn't go to college. My mom went to high school. She ended up raising her siblings because my grandparents moved away. Um, my parents, they worked. So my parents owned and operated delis since my dad, you know, I think as old as maybe 18. They started, they owned bodegas in Manhattan. They owned uh, concession stands in the airports. They owned delis all over Long Island and not chains. So let me like, not, let me preface this by saying my parents didn't own businesses. They owned a business at a time. My parents worked seven days a week. We did not take off days for holidays. There were no sick days. They didn't have insurance. Like my parents showed up every single day. You didn't open late. You didn't close early. You ran the business. My mom also did the bookkeeping for the deli. My dad was the cook. He ran the business. He did deliveries. My parents did it all. There was no days off. I watched my mother and father make personal sacrifices so me and my brother growing up could have a good life. Now, I wasn't rich. We lived okay. We were good. I got, a, you know, I got an education. I did the things. My parents taught me every single day without words. You work hard for what you get. And, you know, there is, there is no asking. There is no expecting. You want something, you work for it. You don't have cash in your pocket, you can't buy it. That's how I grew up. And so if I want something, I am happy to work for it. I will never look for a handout. And I believe that my career, I got where I am because I worked really hard for it. Thank you for sharing that. And as we wrap up um, our show, I just want to ask you some quick fire questions, Christy. Okay. I'm sure there'll be some here that, that you'll like. The first question would be, do you enjoy cooking at home or trying out new restaurants? Do I enjoy cooking at home? Uh, no, I do <laughs> not enjoy it because it's work and it takes me away from other things. Do I cook? Yes. So we don't cook every day in my house. I meal prep every day on Sunday. So Sundays I spend about four or five hours in the kitchen, which I hate, but I watch my Netflix while I do it and I cook for the week. And that way we all have different schedules, whether it's my daughter or my husband or I, everyone has food available for them to eat when they have time to eat. So that is how I cook. Um, but I don't like eating out either because I like to watch my weight. So I don't like, to, I don't like all the salt and the, the junk food that I don't know you know, if it's not in my kitchen, it's somebody else's. I can't trust it. Nice. And I guess the next question is going to lean on that. So if you was having a pizza, are you somebody that would have pineapple or no pineapple, pineapple as a topping? No pineapple <laughs> ever, ever. Give me all the meat, though. I'm here for like sausage, pepperoni, meatball. Like I want like a meat lover's pizza. I want all the meat. No, no fruit. The same as me. And What's your go-to comfort food, Christy? Grilled cheese. Um, I could say anything with cheese, but it's probably definitely a grilled cheese. If I had one thing that I can order, and it's a very specific grilled cheese, but it would be grilled cheese. And are you more of a beach vacation or city break person? A uh, beach vacation. Right. I don't stop. I work hard. When I'm on vacation, I want to be left alone with a book and an ocean view. 
Amazing. And is there any place that sits long in your mind of a beach holiday that you've been to and, and always want to go back? My husband and I got married in the Bahamas. We eloped uh, on NASA. And I, you know, we've talked about we'll be married 10 years this year. And we do keep trying to make plans to go celebrate our 10-year anniversary in the Bahamas. It will likely not happen. Um, but I would love to go back and just maybe renew our vows. That's actually something that I would love to do. And you mentioned Netflix. You watch when you're prepping uh, the food on a Sunday. What's the last TV show that you binge, binge watched? Um, okay. Uh, I don't want people to define me by this, but I am deep in love is blind season six right now. And it is jam packed full of drama and garbage. And I am here for it. In fact, I can't even consume enough of it. I am watching reels on TikTok, on Instagram to hear other people talking about it. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm in it right now. So love is blind season six. My wife watches love is blind. I've never actually watched it. So I will try to Give it a watch. I'm telling you, if you watch it, you will be hooked. My husband is just as committed to Love is Blind as I am. He, In fact, he was the one that said, do you know that season six is exactly. available? And I was like, no. So he, I, I think you might like it. I think it's a nice, it's a nice mental break from all the serious stuff we do all day. All the business stuff. It's nice to just have garbage. But as we end the quick fire questions, I would say it's nice to hear that executives still do have time to watch some Netflix on TV because sometimes I speak to leaders and they're like, I, I don't really watch TV. You know, by the time I finish work, I'm, I'm eating and going to sleep. So sometimes it is that crazy. Um, and just as we finalize the last, last section is a question from a last guest who is Jessica Kritzer, who's the CRO of a company called Lima Charlie, the cybersecurity company. And a question she has is, with change in macroeconomics, what changes are leaders looking to make for 24, 25, and how are they scoping out those changes? I think everyone is trying to scale their business strategically. Um, the big focus for us is not this do more with less mindset, because I hate that. Uh, instead, I'm focused on do better with what we have. Um, and so just a, a complete shift in our strategy around how do we take the resources that we have at our disposal today, because we will not be hiring more and be more thoughtful about it. And this is going to be through the lens of new strategies and programs, leveraging things like AI, Gen AI for a lot of things. And just, you know, I think being more prog pragmatic and, and programmatic about, you know, our initiatives. Nice. And again, Christy, I, I want to thank you for your time. But before I let you go, I have to ask you. What would be a question you would like to share with the next guest? Oh, you know what? Everyone's going to ask all these, uh, these interesting business conversation questions. I'm going to go with how do you define the value of customer success in your organization? Great. I'll be sure to ask that to our next guest. And I hope but that Christy... it's not a, a, a customer success person. I hope that you have like a finance or a marketing or a sales person. That's my hope. <laughs> we have a range of guests, so I will be sure to ask it. Um, and I will try to make sure that it's not a customer success <laughs> guest so that you have a different opinion on that. But before I let you go, Christy, I want to say thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure having you. All of your insights, your humor and um all of your experiences is much appreciated. And also the She's So Sweet podcast, I recommend everyone to give it a listen. It's going to have a Thank lot of you. traction and I'm sure there'll be a, a amazing insights and continuously great guests on your show. Uh, well, thank you so much. I've enjoyed our conversation today. I appreciate coming on and uh, I wish you guys a ton of success as well. Thank you, Christy. You take care and enjoy 2024 for you and the whole client success team. Thank you. Bye-bye.